one. So we can lose this is the Um, so let's uh, start. Now, uh, as usual, before we begin, we need to know what we're going to do today. So um, today is all about classes with resources, but not only classes with resources, but derived classes with resources. So, uh, objects Rule of three for a class. First one is destructor. Destructor. So destructor is part of rule of three. But with the new rule that came when I was teaching in the inheritance and virtuality, we said destructor should exist. create a class, we need to create a destructor in the class. Why? Because we need to delete our uh, any memories that the it allocates, class allocates. Maybe it need to be virtual so that another classes can inherit it. Thank you. So you put the so two important things. So when we learned about inheritance, and then we understood the complications of uh, a base class, uh, pointer or reference pointing to a parent, we said that to delete a child using parent's pointer, compiler only sees the parent and deletes the parent. And what happens? We're going to have memory leaks. So we said a, uh, a class that you create, no matter if you are applying the inheritance field or not, it must have a destructor and it must be virtual. Remember that? That's part of rule of three that has nothing to do with rule of three. Well, because he mentioned destructor first, I had to review that one first. So what is the next rule of three? Do you remember? Copy constructor. Copy constructor. And the last one? 
assignment. So rule of three must be applied. Rule of three must be applied to any class that holds any resources out of the scope because we want to make sure when compiler is copying the damn thing from one place to another, we take over and we don't let the compiler do that. Is that clear? Are we okay with this? All right. And then after rule of three, we understood all the good things that happened with rule of three. Now we are safe. Anything that we do is well. So we can take care of all the uh, good stuff happening behind the scene, um, which is uh, copying and copy assignment. Okay. So I'm going to create a class today over here, and I'm going to call that class base. We're going to go reviewing all the inheritance and stuff in two seconds. I want to first make the ground rules and see what is our objective today. We want to talk about rule of three. Of course, rule of three within inheritance. We talked about all the good stuff where you actually have a class that has three sources out of every stuff and you create the three of three. But what if a resource can inherit this class with three sources out of this stuff? What if a parent has resources out of this stuff? What if I have inheritance, the child has resources, but parent does not have it? What if both have it? We need to know how that's going to get tackled. And that derives class of the resources. Because of that class, we need to take the other thing. So uh, rule of three, four, four classes that we have. And then after that, we're going to go through all the good stuff that we have with the inheritance system. So. So I'm going to create a class. I'm going to call this class a base. So the base class of mine is a, a class that I call it base because I'm the teacher. I want to inherit the system. So, so what I would do over here, uh, I'm going to create an MB. Uh, just uh, this is just a general class that I'm creating so I can uh, trace and see how how things happen when I iterate. It doesn't have any class. Just this. Okay, so I have the class base, and uh, obviously I want to create a few things with this. The very first thing that I do when I create the class we mentioned is we create a destructor for it. Okay, so I create a destructor base, and uh, what do I do with this thing? I'm going to say C out base uh, destructor. And I'm going to print the value that it has so I can keep track of what is being destroyed. OK, and just, I'm just putting messages in it so I can see. Everything's OK with this class now? Thank you. 100% for the next test. All right, so, so, so that we have. Be quick, get bonus marks. All right. So it has to be virtual. We said we need to make all of the structures virtual. That's extremely important. So now I have the base class. I'm going to create the, the whole thing that I need for its construction, destruction, all the good stuff that are constructions and rule of three and everything. So I'm going to create uh, something that default space, OK? It's a good idea to actually uh, initialize this thing to make sure in any cases it's going to be whatever the default value. And then I'm going to create the place using some integer value. This is what happens and the way this space constructor is happening with uh, whatever the value of uh, that is being initialized and is passing back to the end. So we know that uh, this is a default or no argument constructor. Now I have a tentative uh, um, uh, one argument constructor that constructs the base. Then I create the copy construction, which receives the constant reference of the string object and copy. 
reads it and says base is recopied using this value. So it's actually copying this value. Then I create a, a copy at sign of the which is the exact same thing as the base. And um, it says um, base is being signed, not a sing, a sign. Base is assigning this value to that value, so it shows what it is, and it does whatever it's supposed to do. And then we have our destructor, what we just wrote. Obviously, we, we need to remember that uh, a, a, an interesting question is coming up. Remember, uh, be careful. So uh, in here, I'm going to call it B, so I'm going to say base. So in here, I should actually call it copy assign. And this one is base assign. So I'm going to say MB is being set to B. And this one, it doesn't need that because it's impossible. So I simply say the, so that's just the regular, just to remember what is the difference between the two. This is copy assignment. Is a, a, an already existing object, uh, another object of the same type. This is just a regular assignment. Questions? Line number, please. Okay. It's not copying you. Thank you. Better? What else? Find bugs. Go ahead. Actually, you should my thing over there. Thank you. I already gave you one percent, so sorry about that. <laughs> we good? Let it sink in. It's just a sample class with all the good stuff. So here comes the first question. So in here I'm creating a base, base of B, and I'm going to setting it to say one, two, three. What is being called? Give me line number. At line thirty-three. Line nine because the signs at the moment of creation is initialization. Beautiful. So if I run this program, oh, and it's a good idea to actually, I have the, uh, I have, uh, um, let me just uh, make, uh, make it possible to print the class. So I'm going to create the usual write for the class, and I'm going to overload the O stream to, to, uh, to be able to print the base class in it. So I'm going to take care of that one too. Right? So now I can go over here, see out B, and run the program just to give a taste of what's going on. And then we're going to continue after that. So in here, as you see, it creates the constructor, uh, calls the constructor uh, uh, of the base with one, two, three. Then it shows the base with one, two, three in it. And at the end, when everything is over, the destructor of the, the base is called that had the value one, two, three in it. Do we understand how this works? In the, how the other thing works? So anything I do over here, so now if I actually write another one over here, I'm going to call this one C. And if I say B is set, or oh, C is set to B, and then I go over here, C out, C. You know what? I'm going to actually create a, a small little thing over here. I'm going to call it new line. Because I have to keep going to new line, I don't want to keep 
writing new line. So that's just the new line that is getting printed over here. And a new line over here. And in here I'm going to say C. So when I run this program now, the output obviously will be, let's take a look at it. At line 42, first, uh, base is called to the constructor 1, 2, 3. The base is the target. So, I go to new line, I'm setting C to B. So what does it do? It says base copy assigned 0 to 1, 2, 8, 3, Y, because C is the target we are dealing with, right? And it overwrites that one with what he has there. And it's a copy assignment that is happening between the goes to new line. B is printed and, uh, and C is printed. And then the destructors are called back to back to the structure of the uh, one, two, three, and uh, they're both one, two, three. <laughs> Look at this. Okay, so good. So we see that we can actually trace the outcome of the things happening. Right? Okay, so. Now that we have come to the thing to see what, was the, what we're going to do, let's go back and do a quick review of what we've done last time. We talked about inheritance, and we said when we do inheritance, an inheritance happens as follows. So if I want to remember the, the animal kingdom, okay? So we, we created a, a, a cat out of an animal, and we said a cat is an animal this morning that, uh, 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 that has nine lives, and we created a constructive for it and everything. We showed all the functions that it has, and it says any method that a child as has overrides the parent. Um, and then we, we came to the uh, problem of um, base reference and a pointer pointing to, to a uh, uh, base or uh, base reference or a pointer uh, pointing to a derived class. And we said doing so despite everything that we accomplished for all the targets and uh, um, all the uh, things that we added uh, to an animal by creating cats, they vanish when you refer to a cat as an animal. So that's not a good thing. thing. Uh, all your videos are gone. What, what uh, can be done? How can I actually go uh, through creating a, a derived class, making sure that the derived class is met case, there is nothing we can do in a derived class. It's the base class that decides that. So we have to, in our base class, when we are actually creating, in our base class, when we are creating the class, we can decide what can get updated. We make it virtual. That's when we found out that all the structures need to be virtual, right? And after doing all those good stuff, creating virtuals, understanding that if you create something virtual, even if you point to a cat as an animal and say, ah, because as it's virtual, it's guaranteed that always the answer of the cat is going to be a cat. And when you say sound, it's going to always say no, no matter how you say you speak out loud what you mean. Is it? Okay, and after doing that, we came to the point of, after doing that, we came to the point of, what if I just have an idea? And the base class of my must have a capability is either the structure which is more things as Alice can talk, and these are the languages which are not instruments of talking, which are the copy of So for that, we said we cannot do that. We cannot 
create uh, the base classes, uh, the base classes uh, method, but we need that method. So how can we enforce it? We said now if the human being can talk an animal can make a spell, but we don't know how. And then if I say virtual voice sound, it guarantees that all the descendants of animals must implement implement the sound in order to exist. And this pure virtual function makes the animal I don't want to see this. So let me get the microphone, okay? When a base class has a pure virtual method, that class is called? <gasps> no! When a base class has a pure virtual function, that base class is called? Yes. No! Class, it's not an interface yet. We don't have interfaces in C++. Interfaces in C++, there's no difference in abstract data classes. Good try. That was nice. Partially correct. It is. But remember, interface is an object-oriented terminology. It has nothing to do with C++. C++ doesn't have anything. We refer to a base class as an interface, but it has is pure virtual. And that brings us to the next animal. And our animal kingdom thingy that we had. So we actually came over here and we said, if I have an animal kingdom like this, and I have an animal and a pet and a cat and a goldfish and a bird and a bhaji, this animal thingy can dictate what an animal is supposed to look like without actually implementing anything. And that little beautiful thing that I have over there, I call it an animal that can act, move, and make a sound. I have no idea how. Okay? Now, that we call an interface. It doesn't exist in C++. C++ doesn't give rise to kind of things. One method that is pure virtual, or they're all of them. But in object-oriented terminology, we call that an interface. And we mentioned that how that's how Java actually does virtual methods. In Java, you cannot have uh, one of them to be uh, pure virtual. You either have an interface or you have a regular concrete class. So a concrete class, that's why the way we're class that has everything. Are we good with this? Are we good? Yeah, yeah. Can we throw on something from an old dinosaur? Into when I, my time is getting out of it. Can it? Oh, beautiful. I didn't know that. Okay, good. So now I'm corrected. I didn't know. Okay. I come from Java 1.0. <laughs> the last time that I wrote Java was 25 years ago. And that was actually a problem that I had at the time. So now I'm good. Good. Thank you. So it moved. Okay. Well, good. So, but in Java, we have an interface. You can actually create an interface. So you have a keyboard collision. All right. So that's that. So we good. So I have to go correct the other class because I mentioned in that. So God knows what the subscribers keep telling me lies. Anyways, so uh, that's that. So now that we have it. And that was the end of everything when we actually came to. So, and now you're here to go back to what we learned before the midterm to see what happened with the uh, copy construction and copy assignment. So, for that, what I'm going to do is this. I am going to create a derived class over here. So my derived class is identical to the base class. 
The only difference is that the derived class is a base class. We can say property because our default, uh, default constructor which has all the derived class that it has, as you see. Okay. It has its own copy construction. Right? It has its own assignment, copy assignment, and it has its own right over here to write the derived class. Are we okay with this? You okay with this? And in this one, what I will do over here is uh, actually print, uh, I'm call the, instead, uh, instead of doing this, I'm going to actually uh, call the right of the base class too. So I'm going to say base uh, right and pass OSDR to it. And then but we'll print the derived class so we have the book. So it shows what does this thing have inside. So the right of the derived class first calls the right of the base and then right of the derived afterwards. Uh, do you need a uh, uh, refer to the question? It, yeah, it's the same thing as the other one because I copied the other one. So, yeah, I copied my mistake. So, uh, so in here, I have to actually first take this out and say uh, dr md will be equal to. Okay. Okay. Now let's construct. I'm gonna come back to base. Let's just minimize everything like that. We have we know exactly which one is doing what. Um, I'm just gonna have it like this so we can only see the the uh, the prototypes of what we have and their line numbers. We don't need to have that. So like this, we can actually have a quick glance of what everything is. Um, the rule of three for the derive is created. The rule of three for the base are all created. First, let's create a derive and just print it and see what happens. So first of all, I'm going to say uh, it, it, this is not going to make any difference. You know that it's not going to make any difference in the output that we have for the other one. It's identical to the other because uh, I'm just dealing with the base class. Yes. The derived merging and constructor added for the derived? Didn't I put a destructor for it? I forgot. Mm -hmm. oh. So virtual. Do I need to write virtual over here? But, but do we? Hey, no, we don't need to. No, because it's virtuality transit. Remember that? Virtuality transit. But we don't know that. Okay, because I, I just derived the thing, and let's say I don't know, it's always a good idea to add the virtual thing you with. So, so derive, and in here, let me just borrow that from there to make sure that they're exactly the same. All right. So I'm going to say, let me save this over here. So I'm going to write over here. Um, I'm going to add it as, um, say, A dash uh, base uh, unit test. So that was the base unit test. Now let's go back to what we had. Wow. Just break it over here, come back to here. Now let's continue. Now I'm going to actually do it like this. So in here, what I'm going to say would be, let me take that message out too, we don't need it. So I'm just going to say over here, derived D, 
OK? And C out D. Basic thing. So I have a derived class. I have this class. The derived class of mine is not doing any special calls to the base classes constructor or destructor. Please appreciate that fact. OK? Let's come over here, take a look at it one more time. If you look at the derived class, in the initialization area of the derived class of the constructor, am I talking about base? No. In the copy constructor, am I talking about base? In the assignment computer, am I copying the base? No, so I'm not doing anything. This is where you have a base class created, and you, this is where you have a derived class. What happens? So obviously, the very first thing that happens over here, you, when you create the the uh, the, 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 the the derived class, what you're going to have is going to be a base getting getting defaulted and a derived class getting defaulted, which sets the base to zero. Correct? And that base zero is actually the output. So I should have put over here new line. So new line like that and a new line like that just to see what, what happens uh, in a kind of better way. So, so what happens, the base default is called, the derived the default is called. That's where I actually, let me show the source code. So this is line 69. Right? Which I created a derive. Obviously, when derive is created, I do not mention how the base is created, it's defaulted. Now I'll go base zero. That's line number 71. That it shows that I have over there. And why is it showing base zero? Let me see what are we doing in here. So in the right. Ah, fantastic. I love it. Why is it only showing the base? I printing the base over here? Why am I printing the derive over here? And only base is getting called. The reason is when you are actually calling the operator overload for that, there is no operator overload for the derive mode. So obviously, it uses the one for the base because derive is a base. Therefore, let's walk through. Okay? So, so this is what's happening. So when it comes over here, it goes right to the operator equal that calls a base, correct? So it comes over here because it's including the base, deriving the base. Then it says B dot right, correct? It comes to right of B. Did I say the rate of version? So when you are writing the program and you see the objects are Thank you. Okay, so let's fix that. One more time, and now the magic is going to happen. Now, uh, say base plus the right. We good? Questions? Suggestions? Objections? Good. All right. So. So I was here, and as we see when we are coming up, everything is dying in reverse order at the end. So when it reaches to the end, what happens? 
first the derived gets wiped out, and then the base, because the bed virtual and it was proper. And actually, it doesn't make any difference. Even if it wasn't virtual, I had it the right way. What I, what, I'm, what I was about to say, even if I did it like this, even if I say base pointer D is set to new derived, and I printed target of D, it would have worked exactly the same way. No difference because I didn't delete it. <laughs> I just had memory leak. Okay, so delete D. Now run it one more time. It died properly still because the. Are we good? All right, we are doing all kind of reviews as we are going through this, and hopefully. Oh, by the way. You were supposed to get half a percent, and then you didn't. You were supposed to ask the question. Uh, next thing you are coming, you have a quiz. The quiz is on, not on this one. The quiz is on inheritance, neutrality, and interfaces. These three. Okay. Okay, remember. Okay. Inheritance, virtuality, interfaces. All right. So that's that. Now, let's make it more interesting. So, derived classes, the reason that I'm giving you this and I'm telling you, so let me just uh, save this over here. I'm going to say B dynamic uh, default derived. .cpp. Let's go to the next version. Okay, so next one. Now we're going to create a derived class. And set it to one, two, three. Okay? We okay? Everything's good? So if I'm about to do the, what's gonna happen? Let's let's predict what's gonna happen. I am creating a derived class, and I'm putting one, two, three over here. So I, uh, I wish I could. Uh, let me just do it like this. So this is what I'm doing. I am creating a derived class and put one, two, three in it. So, is that a question? Okay. So, what's going to happen over here? What is called at line? What is called at line two over here? Forty-three. Right. So, when it happens, this initializes the base class, right? Sorry, the 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 attribute of the derive, right? What happens in the base class? It defaults it because I did not mention it. Remember what I told you about inheritance, that nothing happens automatically, and you can decide how to create a base class when you are creating a derived class. You have the choice of creating the base class any way you want. Be okay with this? Right? So, so in here, I'm, not, I'm choosing not to do anything. And because I'm doing that, the base class will be default. So if I actually run this program now, you will see that 
the base class has defaulted and the derived class is one, two, three. And when I'm printing, base has no data in it. Okay? So remember, rule number one. Like, for example, I want to pass a tenth of the value that I have to my base class when this is happening. So what do I do? You can actually come over here and remember the order? In the initialization area, when you are initializing first from the base class, then the order of initialization is the exact same order of the attributes inside the class. So in here, what I'm going to do, I can now say, for example, I want to pass one-tenth of the data to the base, whatever it is. So I want base to have one-tenth of Are you okay with this? So now if I run the program, and obviously I'm going to put a comma over here. Now when I run the program, we'll see that actually base is now holding 12 in it. Good? Everything's good? What happens if I have something like this? First of all, what's going to happen is a syntax error because they don't have derived over there. There you go. Okay. And in here, instead of CLT, I'm going to go print derived and I'm going to put D. What did we say about function calls? We said from C language, the parent language of C++, when you do a function call, what happens to the arguments of the function? They are initialized by the values that are being passed to them. So the function call over here will get translated to this. Derived dr set to d. Correct? That's how d is passed over there. Correct? The time and test and moment investigation is a call to? It's initialization, it is construction, right? So I'm constructing a derived using another object, which is copy the index, correct? All right. So now let's run it and see what happens. So when I run the program, and I'm going to just to, to see exactly what's going on in here, I'm going to kind of have an emphasis that this is what happens. I'm going to put some obvious stuff before and after, so we know exactly where print drug is being called. Now if I run this program, what happens? So I should have put a, a, an end L over here. So when I run it, this is what happens. This is when I'm going to the function. So as soon as it gets to the function, the very first thing that happens is that base becomes Why? I just copied it. Didn't I have a copy constructor in the base? Didn't I have a copy constructor in the base? Yes, I did. And it printed some stuff. In so why when I'm copying the derived, the base is being defaulted? Because when you create a constructor, you are responsible to take care of everything else yourself. Because you overtook the copying, because you overtake the copying mechanism, you are responsible to create the base. It's your responsibility. 
the base cover it if you want to initialize the base to stop being pure. If you don't do it, what's going to happen? Get problems. Right? So everything looks okay. It works. And I don't get any, but if you had any information in the base class, it's all gone. Right? So you have to be careful about this. Okay? So now, as you see, the copy is not done properly because in here I knew that I had a 12 in my base, but in here I don't have any 12 in my base. So the live class with resource doesn't mean anything. It literally means how do I manage copying and an assignment when I have it in the live class? It doesn't specifically mean resources. Essentially, type of option, you have to take care of it all. Now, take a look at this. I'm going to comment, I'm going to comment the derived classes, I'm going to comment the derived classes copy construction. You see that? Gone. Now, derived class does not have a copy construction anymore. Now, I'm not, I'm telling you to the compiler, hey, compile it. I don't want to do the cop uh, copy construction sooner than so it's the hand in the hand of the compiler, right? When I run the program now, the difference would be that. This actually got copied. And it got copied too. Right? And why it copied got not copied properly? Because compiler did and I didn't have any resources. So when your derived class doesn't have any resources, you don't need to care about the base class's resources. Just don't implement anything and automatically everything's going to get implemented. Remember this thing. All this complicated stuff that I'm telling you, you have to just transfer it into one, this one statement. When you take over an action, Which means the compiler, you're copying me, and you do, you're copying this object, you will come, you will tell me how I'm going to copy the whole thing by default. So I'm going to call the copy construction of the base, and call the default, call the default copy construction of the base, and call the default copy construction of the derived. But you already implemented the copy construction of the base. So instead of default, that will be called. And therefore, everything's going to go away. Number one, and only, not what the only rule of the only rule of uh, the right classes with the resource is that if you take it over, you have to pay for the whole thing. Pay for over the whole thing. Okay, so. So I'm going to say no copy in derived. Now let's take a look at the assignment operator and see what happens to that. So copying, we know it happened nicely and everything's good. So what if I have over here uh, a uh, derived class, a, a C2 over here, and I'm going to go over here. Uh, D is set to C. Oh, so that's copy assignment, right? That's copy assignment, right? So when I run this, if you look at the copy assignment, as you see, or oh, uh, let me actually print it out too. Oh, 
the other way, the other way, the other way. Sorry, my brain is telling me something. My hand is telling me something else. I don't know. This is what I wanted to say. What happened to the assignment over there? The base did not get copied. The exact same rule for assignment. Now, let's remove the assignment and see what happens. Let's remove the assignment and see what happens. So I'm going to remove this copy assignment over here. Same as the other one. And run it. And everything's OK. Now, actually, base is copied and derived is copied. The exact same rule. So I'm not giving you anything new now. All I'm telling you, all I'm telling you, if you're taking over an action, you yeah. have to take it on paper. It, take over the entire thing. OK? Have you agreed on two points? So I'm just going to give you many examples of the exact same rule. If I came to the class and I didn't review that, I could finish the session in, in five minutes and just tell you. But I want you to really. All right. Water is up there. I have an answer. I see what you're saying. You are saying why is the base class didn't the copy construction? The exact same rule applies. If you copy, you have to take your take care of the copy. However, because you created the copy constructor, the base is going to get defaulted. That was the first example that I gave. So it doesn't matter if you implement again. It has nothing to do with derived classes with an equal sign. It just in terms when you take care of an action, you take care of the whole thing. It doesn't apply if the base class has resources, the derived class has resources. The only rule that applies is that if you are doing copying in the derived, you have to take care of the copying in the base too, however you want. Now, if the base class doesn't have a copy constructor, you can still call it. What is going to get called then? The one that system created, which means the base class will be copied, but you the default thing that the system created, which is a blind copy with no two options, it copies everything by itself, right? And because there is no resource, everything is going to work perfect. Again, to answer that question, I'm going to go back to what I talked about in, in, in week number three. Week number three, when we were talking about constructors and destructors. And I said, when you don't, when you don't have a default constructor, created, no argument the constructor can be created, and we say compiler uses its own, it's not that it doesn't exist. An empty one will get created by the system. When your base class doesn't have an implemented copy constructor, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have copy constructor. It does. But it's the one that is defaulted by the system that is blind copying, right? That's all. That you have to remember. Okay? Okay, so yeah. Did I run this? I think I ran it, right? Yeah, so everything's good. Now <coughs> so this one is gonna be B. Uh, C actually, uh, D actually, D, and it's going to be no copy assigned in derive. Let's see. Now let's go back and do a final design and be done with this thing. Okay? Final design. One. 
Okay. So what I was saying was, when you copy something, to play it in a safe side, it's always a good idea to just pass whatever you have to the, to the base class. I'm saying the right copy the up, right? I just pass it to the constructor, copy constructor on the base class. What you're saying, but this is the web object. Copy constructor is taken care of that one for the moment. It only copies that one. Okay? And when you are doing assignment, what do you do? You simply say, you see at many places they, they, they start casting it to the to the base. So they go something like they go uh, base. And then they go this equals to uh, derive. Don't do stuff like this, please. Okay? Don't do stuff like this. You know that every single operator over and over is simply a function. In this case, all the functions that have come out of your brain of when this is captured to that, what's going to happen is simply that. Just call the base classes up. Uh, assignment operator, so go base operator equal and pass the dr to it. And because the base class is operator equal, takes care of it. If you, if, you did not, if you did not implement this, no problem. The default one is going to get called. If you did implement it, the proper one is going to get called. And everything is going to be taken over. So this is the proper way of that one. And what is, the, what is really true in the destructor? Nothing. Just what that I just said before. Just make sure that the base class is virtual. If your base class does not That's the first for your traits. Okay? Because then you have that. So you have to call the form operator. The team that created it. So I can. So the base class no virtual is in trouble. And that's that. Questions? Yes. There's nothing else over here to actually go through. It's, it's as simple as that as you can get. Okay? All right. So. What can I do? Let the class go? No. Oh, because, yeah, I know I don't get any grade for this class, but we go early because I have the other lab to start in five minutes after I have to run. But we, are, we have 30 minutes, but it's the time. Okay. So five minutes? Okay. Please remind me to continue recording after. Continue. Okay. Somebody forgot the laptop. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so what we're going to do Instead of 
So, to start everything over here to explain how 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 my how I am going to uh, go through this, I'm creating a small kind of a fast hierarchy over here. So I have an interface called displayable. So anything that is displayable is going to be converted from displayable as a virtual virtual function that is. Order to be displayed. Very simple. So displayable says this this is any object that can be displayed should have a method display that passes the O string to it and uh, should be able to get virtually destructed. So that's that. And then I overload the, the operator, the insertion operator to do just that to do for this sender. Now, I'm just going to create a class called container that is display displayable, which means it has to uh, implement the display. It has a non argument constructor and a default constructor that sets the data to either zero or whatever data that it has to it. It has an operator plus that receives two containers and adds the contents of the two. Okay? It has no side effect, so operator plus gets two containers, adds the, the data of the two containers, and creates the name of the container and returns it. And obviously, it can be displayed because it's displayable. And container is a concrete class. Then I have mark. Mark is another displayable object. It has a data of its own. It has a that it is zero to whatever value comes in. Also, it has an operator plus uh, set that uh, adds up the two data of the mark. But the difference is that if it goes more than 100, it keeps it at 100. Nobody can get more than 100. Otherwise, it's going to return the, the, the sum of the two and return the mark. And this operator plus doesn't have side effect at all. Okay? Instead of creating a help. And this one is displayable, and it shows the mark for this one. Says that's okay. That one says clear, so I know which one. Are we okay? No, let's forget about this. Just know that it's both displayable and it can be shown, and they both have operator plus. Now let's come back to here. So I have main. Main has uh, three integers, a, b, and c. a and b have values in it, and they're double x and y. We don't have values in it. Let's say for some reason I want to have a function to kind of show the sum of these two things in it. So this is how I write the function. So I'm going to say int display sum receives two integers, adds up these two integers, and puts it in, in the sum, displays the sum, and returns the sum if it's two to three. Anybody have any question about the some. Now, if I, I can use the exact same display sum for double two, which means I can actually do it like this. Okay. And, oh, I forgot the first one. So if I do something like this, what's going to be the outcome? Am I getting an error in here? Do I have any problem in here? No, it runs. And it compiles. And when I run the program three years later, I'm going to get the message coming out as they are both 30. But this one is 10.1, and this one is 20. What 
happened? How come I can call this day love? It was eight hundred years of casting, right? This is the thickest cut of polymorphism you can have. C++ said, hey, if you want a different logic for that, you're welcome to add it. So your double actually works properly. And now what's the difference between the code of this one and that one? C++ attaches the argument to the name of the function and actually displays some constraint and displays some double trouble. The coffee. So what happens is that when the first one is being called, it says display some with two integers, uh, right? This one with two doubles. And therefore, the outcome will be a proper one. Are we okay with this? Nice. Not only that, because sum is displayable, Sorry, mark is displayable, container is displayable, plus still works for that, right? Correct? Also, I'm uh, sorry, because it's displayable, it can be displayed. And also because they have operator plus overload is controlled, plus will work. So I can do the exact same overload for the mark and the display sum, right? So I can overload this four times. The exact same thing. I overloaded the same thing four times for four different types. And when I run the program for them, they will all work the exact same way perfectly. I have a container of 100 and 200 and a mark with 65 and 70. And the exact same thing, and I'm running the motor over all, all of them. And when I'll see everything lights, runs perfect. Are we okay with this, ladies and gentlemen? This is week one of OOP 2.4. Of course. At the time, we didn't know class. Right? Are we good? Question. Because. The, the plus in mark is a little complicated. If it exceeds 100, it keeps it at 100. Okay. We, we did it that way. So um, I didn't want to create just another container, so I added a twist to the mark. And I said, if the sum of the two is greater than 100, make it 100. Just, <laughs> okay. I had to make it a different. Otherwise, why would I create another class, right? Are we okay with this? When you think about it, when you think about it, so this is this is overloading. When you think about it, I can bring anyone, anyone who has And I say, this is the pattern. I'm going to take the, because you see everything is identical, right? I'm going to take it and I'm going to say, this is the type. This is a type. This is a type. And this is a type, right? And just remove everything. And I asked the person, could you please rewrite that one? Put int instead of type. What's going to be the result? Int display some int plus int s int sum equals correct. That's right. I'm going to tell, could you please add over here container? Because it's container display, container f. Right? As long as the type that you have supports a no try the fake binary class. And they can each uh, properly pass by values. 
return by that, they have copy construction. And they are very simple exploits, right? Correct? And you can give it to anyone with no knowledge of C++, say, play, copy and paste, and give me a main function, everything's going to work, correct? Right? Everybody, everybody agrees with that? That's C++. You can actually say, hey, this is a template. And type name is type. Done. So now, when you write this, compile, you say display some. And you type, type, and the thing may be my main, am I? No. So no, please. Display some variable. I have a template. And this is A and A. Is whatever. No, what is this one? C is container. So container. And when you run it, it is the exact same thing. Absolutely no difference. So when you have identical logic, when you have identical logic for any process for many different. So the com but there are many precautions that has to be done. Because then now I can, I'm going to say, I have a bank account. I'm going to say, account display sum, account A, account B, and display the sum of an account. Is it guaranteed it's going to work? No. So what are the things I have to look, look for? Pass value. value. Copy construction. Assignment at the moment of creation. Copy construction. Plus. Get return and return something that works a little bit, right? Is it capable with O three? Can it be returned by value? All these things must be documented in your template. Template is pounded. Heavy documentation explains what are the critical things the type needs to support for this thing to work. So if I have a bank account, I can check. Does bank account have trust? Is it copied safely? Does it have pull off? Yes. So if I want to do this, all I need to do is to use that magic three slashes over here, one and a two and a three, and I'll go through every single thing and explain everything over here. And in the parameter type, I have to say must support, must support what? Support uh, plus with no side effect and rule of three. Right? And then write the summary and all the good stuff that's what it returns and everything. So anybody uses it? They will know. Introduction to templates. And that's actually as far as we go. I'm gonna give you some tricks of this on this one. If we have extra time at the end of the semester, I'm going to have one session. Only those who are interested will come in, and I'm going to teach class rights. It's a good start for your OP345. OK? Just letting you know that templates are part, is all the templates, they are part of C++. Everything that you can imagine, anything to have Please remember that old you want that? There is an app for that. Remember, remember? You want to do this? There is an app for it. Right? You want to do anything in C++, there's a template for it. Anything, any data structure, anything that you can imagine of. There is a template for it that is already written for you to use in the most efficient way. Oh, yes. It's called STL, Standard Vast amount of logic in it that you can use and write the most efficient program you want, the safest way you can do your thing. So if you have time, we're going to have one extra session about templates that helps you with three, four, five a lot and gives you a kickstart. And now we can see some of the features you need to be strong. So I just wanted to make sure for yes, everybody to get it. It's a beast. That doesn't mean it's, it's difficult. 
you have a tame lion, believe me, that's a good pet to have. So it is a beast, but it's a good beast to control and tame. All right? Are we okay, one? Are we okay, two? Please don't come after what you've been doing questions. Are we okay, one? Are we okay, two? So have a beautiful day, everyone.